Guys, welcome back to the Ice Project. Um, as you would have already seen, Kobe Shorts have dropped. We're about to launch a new collection this Thursday. They're dropping 6 p.m. Uh, the full winter autumn collection titled Hindsight 2020 is going to be available this Thursday. So I'm excited for that. We're going to drop a bunch. We're going to drop a bunch of content leading up to that. But back to the podcast. Roll the intro. Troy Savage, what's up? Hey, bro. Thanks for uh, yeah inviting me today. It's um, good to see everything and yeah, just a bit different than seeing the photos on Instagram and everything. So it's yeah, it's pro as here, bro. Everybody sees that, eh? Does it look a lot bigger? Yeah, massive. Um, yeah, you sort of just see photos. I don't know. It's just it's a good feeling in here. Like very very professional, nice and tidy. Yeah, it's good, bro. It's good. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Uh, um, so for anyone that doesn't know who you are, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name's Troy Savage. Um, but first of all, that's a fucking cool name, eh? Hey? Get- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got to thank my family. I don't know. I can't like claim anything to that. I can't make <laughs> my last name up. But um, yeah, um, yeah. So my name's Troy Savage. Um, well, I would have had a big long intro, or yeah, a bit about me. Give us a bit um, of context. Where, where have you grown up? What do you do? Yep. So grew up in Napier in Hawkes Bay. Um, so that's in New Zealand. Um, yeah, love my footy. Um, footy background. So played. Yeah, childhood, played rugby, um, really loved sort of that same dream that everyone has, like want to be an all-black sort of thing. Um, and then sort of done all my schooling, played footy, first 15s and whatnot. Um, Wait, there's different parts of Hawke's Bay. What part of Hawke's Bay? Napier, from? Napier. Ah, it's a nice yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, the nice part, not the, not the rough part. <laughs> so you got Napier boys? <laughs> yeah, Napier boys, so born and bred there. Quite a prestigious uh, yeah, rugby union school, eh? Yeah, footy school. So I was at another high school when I was growing up and then moved to that high school for the footy, like specifically. Yep. Mm. Uh, when did you transfer over to rugby league? Um, so my last game of rugby union was for school and um, then my first – Rugby league game senior was that day as well. So we finished up the first 15 game and then went straight to the senior game that day. So, yeah, so 18 sort of years old was my first sort of senior rugby league footy. footy it's crazy, game. eh? Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was awesome. So it was like sort of like trying to figure out how to like not roll the ball back pretty much. It was the first <laughs> thing, my first like little little thing that I needed to like just worry about. I was like, just please don't roll the ball back. Please don't roll, roll the ball back like I'm like rugby union. So, um, yeah, and then from there, we sort of, like, it was a pretty rough league back then, like, all the mongrel mob and all the black power, like, it was very, um, yeah, so all the Maldives play, like, it's a very rough sport. Um, um, mongrel mob started in Hawke's Bay, didn't it? In Hastings? Yeah, I think so. Is so, it Flex Me? Is that, yeah, is that a place something like that. Um, I'm not too sure on all the history, but, yeah, there's a bit of gang culture back then and where, where, where I sort of grew up, yeah. Does your family part of that um, mob... Nah, we're sort of we're, our area was sort of like the sort of like the Black Power area. So oh, okay. yeah, so um, but not we weren't affiliated in any way, but we wouldn't be wearing red around the streets. <laughs> that's what I was talking about. <laughs> but that's funny because I grew up in Tokyo and we had a very similar like we yep. had a, it was a Black Power area and we yeah. just we just didn't grow up wearing red. Like yeah. if I wore a red hat like this yeah. that I'm wearing now, like someone would try and fight you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, <was laughs> like, it sounds so, stupid yeah, now, so, but it sounds yeah heaps stupid. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, in my wardrobe now, there's no red like. It's mm. just, yeah, but not like I hate the colour red. It's just, yeah, I grew up like that. I think, I'm, I've, I, think I was the opposite because I was never allowed to wear red. Like I actually like enjoy yeah. wearing red now. It's such yeah. a good colour. I think I have one or two things, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. You it's funny walk how like when you grow up and you take on those things like from mm. childhood, yeah. Mm. So um, you, signed, you signed with the Roosters when you were pretty young? or Yeah, so we, at the end of that year, my first sort of rugby league days, um, there was like the Mouldy tournament in Auckland. Oh, yeah. And the New South Wales Mouldy team came over and they played sort of our team in the final and the manager for that team I was traveling with them was Arthur Beetson and he was the recruitment manager for the Roosters and my brother had already uh, secured like a contract with the Roosters because he was footy six years older than me Mm. and then on the back of that I sort of got picked up off that just seeing like yeah playing really good in that final and they just invited me over and then yeah the rest is sort of yeah, from there, that's how I got to Australia. And you haven't left since? No, nah, no. Nah. Go back every now and again, but yeah, I've never left. So never Nap- left. Napier to Bondi, bit of a, <laughs> <laughs> bit of a culture change? Yeah, a bit change. of a dramatic, but um, the, sort of the first place we had was in Alexandria, which was where the office is, so mm. probably like 
man, a couple of hundred meters up the road on McAvoy Street was where our first apartment oh, was. Oh, really? Yeah, I know where first that is, started yeah. Le- first started living, so it was pretty crazy. Were you on Nazi NRL in that? Yeah, I was Nazi NRL, <laughs> all that stuff. So I think I used to love watching that. A eh? couple of years, yeah, that was really good. They need to bring that back, actually. Mm. So I've done a few things with that. Um, yeah, it's just real good when, especially when you don't, you see a bit of the behind the scene things. Yeah, yeah it's a bit I of a culture change. Yeah. So uh, would you obviously had ambitions to play NRL? Talk us, talk us, talk us about your journey at the Roosters. Yeah, so under twenties at the Roosters came over as like a, a eighteen year old. Um, so Jersey flag back then. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I walked the – that was 2005, I think. So the year before was when they lost the Jeez. grand final to, to the bull, Bulldogs. Yeah. So, yeah, my first sort of sort of training session, I walk into the changing rooms, I turn left and get introduced to everyone. So Luke Rickardson, Craig Wing, Jason Kalis, Adrian Morley, Minicello, Michael Crocker. Like I was just like, oh, my God, yeah. like, Jesus. Like, and then – to the other side of the changing rooms was Sia Soliola, Sam Perrett, Jamie Soward, and they were still just reserve grade players back then. So that's sort of the caliber of the changing rooms that we walked that I walked into, if you know what I mean. So mm. it was like, yeah, for a kid just from Napier, like to walk into that was just like, oh, my eyes were just wide open. Like, <laughs> how, how how good's this? So how did your footy career go? Um, so I spent two years, uh, or probably. Three years at the Roosters, 20s, and then played some reserve grade with Newtown. Mm. Um, sort of, yeah, the ambition was to play like first grade, obviously. Um, and then from there, sort of like went into the, like didn't play first grade, went into sort of the wilderness of uh, reserve grade playing. Um, went through a couple of clubs like Newtown, um, went with Ville, Shell Harbour Dragons, just trying to find that, like, you know, that little crack to get. You know, it's shot at NRL. Mm. Um, and then sort of eventually made my way through Wentworthville and got my, like, sort of last contract at 26 years old, like, full-time NRL contract, which mm. was, like, they don't they don't come around that often once you're that age. Um, and then, yeah, sort of got a little opportunity at Para, but that wasn't to be either, but, yeah. So you had a couple of pretty big injuries. Uh, it's pretty important to where you are right now. So do you yep. want to talk about some of those big ones you had? Yes. Yeah, so had like many ankles and hammies and little AC like injuries on the shoulder. Um, but the main ones were broken leg. Um, so what kind of broken leg? Like tibia, uh, tibia, tibia, dislocated ankles. So had to get a screw, had to get a, like a metal plate. Um, yeah, that was awful. I sort of scoring a try and someone came across and they just landed on the bottom and then yeah, it snapped. Yeah, Did so you hear it? Yeah, nah, see. I was just like, I just had a little, like, I felt a little pop and then, like, just that pain of that, that feeling. I was like, oh, is that the, just an ankle sprain, like, that real intense? It didn't go away for a couple of minutes. I was like, oh, it's bad. And then the trainer comes over and he says, oh, I think you broke your leg. And I was like, nah. It's like third, fourth game in the season up in uh, Queensland Cup, Burley Bears. And he said, oh, well, it's not broken if you can walk five steps. So I was like. I always give this a little go. So I was like, yeah, heap stubborn back then. I went, nah, it can't be broken. So I walked five steps on it and I said, yeah, sweet, can't be broken. Mm. So just the ankle and then the next day woke up and then looked down at my foot and I was just like, yeah, blown, balloon like an, like an elephant leg. It was all purple. And then I was like, oh, I've got to drive myself to the hospital because <laughs> <Now, laughs> I, I left all the like medical stuff. I said, like, nah, I'm good. Just give me some crutches. I'll be right. And then yeah, you have auto. Hey, you driving yeah, the auto? yeah, I had an auto. I think yeah, like lucky. Yeah, yeah, I had a good flatmate at that time, which was um, yeah, funny. He had to come get the car because I had to go straight in the surgery that day. Yeah, oh, scary. <laughs> so well, when you, I, I look back at my injuries. I've done ACL, snap my Achilles, snap my pec. I'm yep. so thankful that I had them now. Yeah, I, I didn't appreciate them at the time, and I don't know a little bit of a different story of where we ended up, but like. Do you do you regret those injuries or have they shaped you into the person you are now? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, but at the time, yeah, they're like the most worst things ever. Like your life, <laughs> when, yeah. your life's ended pretty much when your you're like your season's over. Like it was the start of the season when I broke that leg, and I was like, oh man, like I'm trying yeah. to crack it. Like I need to play. Like it's sort of like your livelihood. But then when you look back on it and reflect on things, like you're like, yeah, I'm grateful for that, and sort of sort of um, molded me into sort of the journey I. I am on now. Yeah. Mm. So let's talk about their journey. Um, obviously, you stopped playing rugby league. What were those next couple of years like? Um, so stopped playing rugby league. I did a little stint over in France for two years and just played overseas. Um, that was just sort of get around, like do a bit of travel and whatnot. 
But um, yeah, I sort of just had that little um, chip on the shoulder sort of thing. Like man, you didn't quite crack it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't play in or out. That was the dream. Mm. And uh, I was like, man, I got to figure out what, like, what did I need to do? So I went sort of down the route of like, what sort of training, like, uh, what sort of training could I have done better to make myself like better to just crack? Because I was close at certain times. Like, how close did you um, get? Um, so probably para. Oh, there was. One year at the Roosters where it was when Chris Anderson was coaching and I think we sort of got brought up into the full-time squad, me and another guy, I think Danny Williams. And Danny Williams, he debuted that year. Is he the guy that blind shot that guy from, from <laughs> Melbourne? Nah, I think there's a there's two oh, Danny okay. Williams, yeah. And then <laughs> and then he debuted and I was like, yeah, man, this is my shot. And then Chris Anderson retired that year because uh, they were running pretty bad and then Freddie took over and then didn't get a look in. Um, that was one time. And then the other time, just sort of had power plates on first grade trials. Mm. Um, yeah, had a real good season. Certain times I didn't do the right things anyway. So reflecting on like, yeah, I didn't deserve to get a shot. Like I'm happy. Like I'm not not dirty on anyone not giving me a shot. Like because I knew I was doing the wrong things anyway. Like just training slack and at certain times drinking. Like, you know, just the – just the dumb things that you <laughs> you don't know about and it's just like that lifestyle you're trying to like, I don't know, just trying to upkeep, trying to go out and like partying or nightclubbing or whatever like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that was the other. So at Paris I was pretty close then and then, yeah, so I just had to figure out like what was that little thing that I needed um, to like just be able to play that one game that I was looking for mm. and sort of like I'm grateful that I, I, ha- I didn't get to play because I'm happy where I'm at right now like yeah through those couple of years I've learned like a lot about myself and a lot about like physically mentally and sort of spiritually as well so yeah I'm happy where I'm at and I'm happy how it's all panned out it's funny you touch on that um like I always say to people I'm glad I was an average in NRL like I'm, I was like yeah. I got to play NRL and I got to play a test match but I go fuck I'm, I'm so happy that I was an average yeah. NRL <laughs> player because when I go back to like say normal life or I don't want to say my life's too normal but it is normal for me yeah. I'm like the adjustment from being that so instead of someone like a, that's a superstar yeah. and they have to adjust to normal life, it's, yeah. there's a massive step between there. And me and Justin talk about it all the time. Yeah. We're like, fuck, yeah. we're glad yeah. we're average because then because yeah. when we transfer back into civilization or just normal everyone else's reality, yeah. it's not not so much of a difference. And we got to see it all and witness it and experience it, but sort of grateful for being average. But in saying that, moving forward to this next phase of your life, like I don't want to be average. I've yeah. been average before. And I'm sure you feel the same. Yeah, exactly. Like all the lessons you learn through like all those hard times, like trying to um, like manage a footy career with like, you know, taking shitty jobs, like mm. like five shitty jobs, like throughout like the career, like washing cars, traffic control, like security guard, like just to try and balance that life so you can have enough time for footy training. Like, and I know there's a lot of players doing it. And mm. then unfortunately, like, there's only a certain amount of players that play each week in the NRL. Everyone else doesn't play, and that's just that's just professional sports, and that's why people get paid so much, and that's why you know people miss out. So, so you're in there. For, um, so you've gone to France for a couple of years. You're in this transition phase right now. Like, what made you want to do this? Um, so, like, firstly, my body was just fucked from all the footy, um, all the training, all the injuries. Um, I had mad lower back pain. I'd wake up with lower back pain and it just ruined my day. Like as soon as I woke up and I felt that little, oh, my back's fucked. So I was just like, what's sort of the, like what's the fix? Like I can't just take anti-inflams my whole life. I can't just keep going to the physio. Like what's the, what's the actual fix that I can do? That was a common thing like when we're coming through 40 yeah, As soon as like there was an injury, I was like, fuck, where's the tremolol? Like where's yeah. the painkillers? Where's the, like, where's the Valium? Yeah. And like it's a temporary fix, but it's so bad for you, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So all those things are sort of what I'm against now. So like they're quick fixes and you're like they, they play their role, but they shouldn't be like the long-term solution. Like you shouldn't have to live on um, pain meds or like even anti inflams like for your life. Like, and I think – a lot of footy players do go through that, and it's that, that's the easy route. But there's um, other options, and they're they're hundred percent like better than taking that for the rest of your life. So you lower back pain. Where did you start researching? Um, just online. Um, I hooked up with. No, firstly, I sort of just I was just looking for some stretches, and then I found a guy. He's a CrossFit guy in America, and he was just pumping mobility at that moment. What year are we talking here? 
Um, 2012, 2011, oh, something. So like, oh, 2013 actually. So yeah, you've few, been at it a minute. Yeah, yeah, a few years ago now. Um, so the first time, and I got on a bit of his stuff, and I was doing a few of his stretches. Um, just opening up the hip flex. I still use the same one today. Um, not on myself, but anyone who has like lower back pain, I say fix this, and then like your lower back's gonna start feeling better. Where does just lower back pain come from? Hip flexors. Yeah, tight hip flexors usually is the main cause. Um, got a few standards that I sort of check people over, and if they can't do that, then and they're probably like, because if you think about the body, if you can't bend from your hips, um, then like it's you have to bend from somewhere, and the lower back's gonna be the part of your body that's going to be taking that load um or the sitting doesn't help driving to work sitting um sitting at work in the office sitting at home watching the tv just turns off all that you know and it's just yeah the health of everyone probably in the world is deteriorating because of that we sit so much have you seen um david goggins interview with jay rogan and he talks about he had that lump on the back of his head no i I missed that oh so like basically like he was just saying that like once he started stretching and stretching out his hip flexors, this big bump on the back of his head went down. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Have you seen that, Luke? Yeah. I'm not making this shit up, am I? Yeah. Body's amazing thing. Like once you get it running right or even running wrong, it's going to like, you know, cause some problems. But once you get it running like full tilt and like, you know, we're not supposed to be living in pain at all. You know mm. what I mean? That's, but you know what I mean? Like sometimes there's no solutions or people feel like there's no solutions, but there is they're out there you know we shouldn't be in pain at all so you found this guy in australia i know sorry the u.s yeah and he was big on mobility yeah big on mobility um with because the crossfitters are quite you know they need in their positions that they need to be in and then yeah i just start i always relate everything back to footy like fuck how good would, would that have been like in my career like what feeling and, good yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah not feeling like shit the whole season yeah and then um yeah, so from there I just started doing that and I was like, fuck, this mobility thing's all right, so what else can it fix? And then sort of from there got involved with um, with Keegan, yeah, you know Keegs, um, and then he was, um, at the time, he was pushing the whole like holistic health thing and then... And it was, that was kind of rare at the time, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, nah, back then like no one was doing that, so like, and social media wasn't even that big back then, like Instagram wasn't like, it was like Facebook at that time, and then... Um, yeah, I got involved, just seeing his different view and since he had a footy background and then I was just, everything I looked at was like, how does it, how could it have helped me to be a better player? And that's all I like thought about like, okay, if I had less tight hip flexors, no lower back pain during the season, yeah, I could have played better, I could have been in better shape and all that stuff. So, And Keegan talks about that. So anyone that doesn't know who Keegan Smith is, he's the son of Brian Smith, a uh, pretty interesting character, sort of. Um, had issues when he was younger, started traveling around the world, hanging around indigenous people and got linked up with uh, Trent Robinson over at Catalans. And yep. the growth that that team had well, while he was there pretty much got both of them landed at the Roosters and they've had success ever since and a sustained success. And Keegan was always a big part of that, sort of took off and done his own things. And I've had interactions with Keegan as well and tried yep. many of the stuff he's done. I've flown up and hung out with him for a couple of days. Pretty interesting character. Yeah, so he sort of came as like one of my mentors, uh, become one of my mentors. And so, yeah, I learned to like everything of him. Like he was pushing like handstands and mobility and juggling different shit. Yeah, juggling, yeah. like really like against the, against the grain sort of stuff, you know, when everyone's like zigging, he was zagging. And that's what I really liked. Um, I felt like he was trying to come up with better solutions to some of the problems that were out there. And yeah, just having that footy background, like we related heaps. Heaps good, you know, to start. So And, yeah, that's always a good place to start when you yeah. have someone you can sort of align yourself with. But I remember going up to him and they were talking about goal setting. Yeah. Like we've done this, like, hour thing on goal setting. I was like, oh, fuck, I've never set a goal before. Yeah. And he was sort of big on – and I wrote a post on it today. He's like, never been in the same spot you are from yeah. like last year. And he talked about, like, he was probably one of the first pe- people that started talking about money. He goes, I want to double my income, like, every single yeah. year. And that, that was kind of a weird subject to talk about, but – from a holistic view, he's talking about growing Instagram followers. Like this is like 2013, 14 Instagram followers, like better mobility. We're waking up every day doing mobility circuits. And it seems like almost common now, but back then it was so rare. Yeah. So like mobility never gets really mentioned that much with back then anyway, like now it's starting to like come to shape. Um, so yeah, that sort of sent me on that whole journey with him. He's a good dude. Um, yeah. We've related real well. Um, 
yeah, spent a bit a couple of years with him. He sort of had this real movement sort of thing, and that's what sort of I'm a part of now. And like, what is what is real movement? Okay, so the best way to describe real movement is sort of like a connecting hub for um, coaches or people who just want better in their lives, um, and then all the individual brands sort of join up, you know, network through that that brand is sort of set up as like a bit of a hub, and then like just to create that synergy. Um, so like once you So it's like getting light minded individuals together Yeah to, exactly Like yeah. it's just a community um, Like everyone has their different thoughts At different backgrounds So we have like powerlifters We have uh, crossfitters Gymnasts um, for, Yeah gymnasts Footy players Like everyone has their different uh, background But they just want to be better coaches You know they want to say Yeah that holistic Whole holistic thing So Maybe a footy player needs to do a bit more mobility, like which is like mobility comes from gymnasts. They're the most mobile people, but also from the movement guys that have a little bit with handstands and all that. So, yeah, it's just trying to be better collectively. Yep. I remember when you said that, and that's when kind of muscle-ups were, were the kind of like sign of strength. But yep. you're saying gymnasts, that's just how they get up onto the thing. That's yeah. just like the starting position. Yeah, exactly. Like all the movements are crazy, and like it just opens up like a big, big wide world, like and then just – for an athlete anyway, we're like rugby league players, like, you know, we do our weights and that, but maybe we could work on our mobility a little bit to improve everything else. I remember Ronnie Palmer used to say, like, we used to have these blue mats where we've done mobility, and he goes, you get strong off the mat, but you stay, oh, wait, like, the, the way to stay on the field is it starts with on the blue mats, and he always talked about mobility and stuff. Yeah. But we were just, it was like 10-minute stretches, or 10-second stretches, and then change Fuck, let's yeah, get in the showers and fuck yeah, off for coffee. It's like, yeah, that's what, yeah, mobility sort of morphed um, into different things. Um, so, yeah, mobility was just a bit of a stretch. Um, and then, sort of, how I learned it was through the CrossFit guy, then a bit of gymnastic y stuff. And then, sort of, the movement, sort of yoga guys. Um, mm. The movement guys are sort of like, no, uh, Ido Portel. He's yeah, like, he, he, he's known for doing um, Conor McGregor. Conor stuff, McGregor. Right? So like, so it's sort of about like on my journey. I sort of just wanted to take a little bit from each person. Like, don't dive too deep into their whole thing because Ido goes a bit movementy, which sort of wouldn't relate back to sort of the clients like footy players that I would relate to. So that wouldn't have any benefit. But a lot of his stuff does have benefit. Like his sort of standards of movement and all his mobility stuff that he does. So I took a little bit from there, a little bit from like different gymnastic coaches. Um, but mostly, yeah, mostly through Keegan, had it pretty much figured out already, like I felt like. So I got most of my stuff from him. So, yeah. What was the biggest thing you've learned from Keegan so far? Oh, I don't know, just like – like. Apart from all the training stuff, which is, like, great, um, just, like, yeah, he's real good with all the goal-setting mindset stuff, you know what I mean? Like, just thinking bigger. Like, he'll be like, why can't you have, like, professional players? Like, And he just, like, instills that little bit of confidence in you. Mm. Um, so, like, I, I chat with him and have little conversations, and he's just like, yeah, just keep pushing. Like, there's always that guy that, like, yeah, keep doing better, keep doing better. Like, well, why can't we change this? Why can't we change that? Like, he's always asking those hard questions of you. He lives it, He lives that life every single day, too. I, yeah. I remember following him on Christmas Day. I was just sort of fucking around on the couch, and he's sort of in there doing his squats and doing yeah. his shit. He goes, oh, I don't, like, I don't defer from, from my journey, even yeah. though it is Christmas Day. Yeah, and that's sort of like, that's Keegan. Keegan's Keegan. Like, he's... He's an extremist. Yeah, he's like, yeah, he's hard. Like, he's good. I wouldn't call him hardcore, but, like, yeah, he has his, like, he's really... Um, involved in what he wants to achieve. Mm. Um, sometimes he ruffles people's feathers, but like he's been through that. He's been through his own journey himself, and we had a good chat up in Gold Coast. And like he's like sort of admitted to some of his mistakes that he made. So he's very humble, and he's on a like the path that he's on now is sort of yeah. That's why I got him back involved with real movement. It sort of died down at a, mm. at a stage, but then sort of he's sort of started again, and like yeah, everything's. Yeah, he's learned from his mistakes as, as well. So, yeah, I'm happy to be a part of it and, like, sort of help, like, help him out with all his things that he wants to achieve as well. Mm, sick. So, what did you learn from Wim Hof? Wim Hof? Mm. Oh, that was good. Um, I, I watched one thing on Netflix with him last night. He's yeah, an interesting guy, he's eh? He's very interesting. I love him, man. He's, like, I don't know. He's got, like, this infectious, like, energy. I went to one of his – so. Same through real movement, learnt all that stuff first, got into all the breathing, um, and then just still that relating back to um relating back to that footy player, like how could Wim Hof breathing like help me out in like my footy career? Like So like when I do Wim Hof, it's like 
How often do you do it and what is it to anyone that doesn't know it? So Wim Hof is a breathing technique. Um, it's re- really simple. So it's pretty much 30 deep, big breaths in um, and then a little breath hold at the end. Um, I, I, I do it in the morning. I've yep. started doing it every morning before yeah. I jump in the cold shower. Like I yeah. have the warm, do it. And then on my second round, I want to have uh, – it doesn't yeah. even feel that cold, does it? Yeah, nah, like, yeah, builds up your resistance to cold. Um yeah, but it's just like that that calming mind effect. I like I've tried meditation, um, and I feel like my mind's just going crazy too much. And then I feel like when I do the breathing, that's sort of my meditation for my quiet time for the day. Um, so when you're concentrating so much on your breathing, you can't actually think. Mm, that's that true, makes isn't sense. It? Yeah. Like you're like such intense on the breath, like like that for 35 breaths and you're putting so much oxygen in your body that you're not normally used to and then you start getting a little tingles and whatnot and then like it's just a nice relaxing feeling like i'm like man i find would you call it relaxing i don't know if it's too relaxing yeah Yeah, i'm I'm relaxed like so my 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 hands start tingling like a little bit and then like you know when you fly out and you hold your breath and you hold it for as long as you can and you don't get that real lightheaded feeling yeah and fuck i'm just like oh shit like i feel like yeah like you you can get the buzzy one where you can like like really push the breathing, like get like real fast in there. I can do a nice slow one. Did you ever like, do those Norse tanks <laughs> back in the day in the balloons? <laughs> That's what it reminds me of, eh? Yeah, so. me and I were talking about it yesterday. So, yeah. do you reckon you've got to be like? Do you, can everyone? Do you think everyone can work to that level? Or you no, got to, I reckon you've got to be hard. a little. You got to be like a, what the ice bath ones where they. Nah, the ice bath's a little bit different. But this breathing technique in the morning, bro, that, this ain't hard to do. It's, yeah. all, it's foolproof, nah, bro. You so, can't. You can't yeah. fuck it up. Yes. I reckon you got to be a different type of weird to do the ice bath ones and stay in there and get to that. Get to that point. Like some yeah, people aren't ta- ice tapped in for that. Oh, yeah, yeah, a, yeah. Say, I'm one with you. I was awful at ice baths. But he says, yeah. um, Wim Hof says a, a cold shower a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah, yeah. So just like big thing about him is like building that resilience. Like, you know, we're so um, today's day and age, like so just looking for comfort in everything we do. Like, and then it's, I feel like it's just making us soft. So we're getting sicker. We're getting, you know, like our health's deteriorating. And like, you know, and he's just like, what's the... What's the hardest, the quickest, hardest thing you can do straight away is jump in ice, you know what I mean? And like the body's just going to adapt straight away. So, and some of the science, like that, he's been linked up to machines and yep. taking blood work and he's flipped like disease and stuff like that. Is yeah. It- so it gets really crazy when he goes into all the science part where they, um, oh, I'm not exact on this, but they, Injected him with like a flu or something. <laughs> oh, what's that, bro? And he got rid of it, eh? Yeah, like two got days. Rid of it, but not just him. So, like, he, taught like five five other people to be able to like fight it off as well if you want to look into this um he's a pretty interesting guy but there's one on netflix and like my my girlfriend was watching it It was real easy to watch and yeah. she's with like gwyneth paltrow and um a group of her g- go to do it and that was just really easy to watch so if you want to keep like looking into this Wim Hof type yeah. method watch that on netflix yeah, it's, it's pretty so cool. simple to do you don't need anything you just you know it's 30 th- 35 deep breaths how many rounds do you do just one uh, depends on time but like three is good e cold shower every day Nah, not not so much. At, not like right at the moment. I used to, um, but when I'm, yeah, it's sort of just like I probably should. Um, like if I have my perfect routine down, I'll probably go Wim Hof in the morning with a cold shower. But sometimes I'm just up and up and go sort of thing. Yeah, boy, you have a wash, boy. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I still have a shower, but it's just not cold. <laughs> nah, so like my morning routine right now, and I've done it since the start of this year. It's mm. like. Like I've taken bits and pieces of different people. Tim yeah. Ferriss is one of them. Tony Robbins, obviously Wim Hof's the other one. I just do 10, 10 push-ups. Yeah. Um, Wim Hof shower until we finish on the cold, and then I just write three things I'm grateful for. Yeah. And that's all I do every morning. And no matter when I've woken up, excited to get up or a little bit tired after I've finished that, I feel great because like one, like physically I've done something, then I've shocked the nervous system with the cold shower, and then I've cleared the mind with the journal. I'm just like I'm. I'm good here. Like, and then yeah. I just roll into work and like excited and stuff. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, yeah, morning routines, everything, and put the Wim Hof in there. Like, yeah, you start pretty good. Interesting. You know I mean? Yeah. All right. So, one of the big topics we're going to be talking about is um the carnivore diet. It's in a world where everything seems to be going towards vegan, and they're yeah. a very outspoken um group of people. And I've yeah. have you tried being vegan? No. Maybe two days worth. Yeah, I've so yeah. I've I've done I've watched game changers and turned vegan yep. for like a week or two. Yep. Um let's let's touch on this carnival diet. Yeah, so it's sort of I don't know if it's like mainstream, but it's it's out there now. So carnival diet's pretty much just I wouldn't meat. say it's mainstream, it's very nah, like niche. Yeah. 
the, just the thought of it sounds like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like just fucking eat a steak every day. What <laughs> yeah. the fuck? All you're doing is just eating meat. No so veggies, no fruit. Historic. Hey. <laughs> Sounds prehistoric. Yeah. yeah. Taking yeah. back to the caveman days, yeah. Um, but um, Joe Rogan's probably the one that's brought it to light, one of yep. the biggest podcasters in the world. And he done a podcast with Jordan Peterson. He's a very smart yeah. guy, written great books. And he talked about um, he had autoimmune immune diseases. And mm. just through eating this, his daughter was this big one where she yep. grew up with arthritis as a kid and had to yeah. have like a hip, rip, hip replacement when she was like 12 or some fucking shit. Yeah. Always had um, eczema and shit on her, like always had rashes. And just through the process of life and yep. sorry, severe depression was the, was the main one. Yeah. And she couldn't really walk around as a kid. And he asked her, he goes, if you got to pick one depression or arthritis, what would you keep? And she goes, I'll keep the arthritis every day. And she goes, they asked her, what was the depression like? He goes, imagine like the 10, the 10 people that you love the most in the world and they died yeah. worse than that. And that's how she described depression. And she yeah. goes, I'd rather have arthritis and she couldn't even walk around. So through the process of elimination, which, are, which, which the carnivore diet is? The eh? carnivore, is it, yeah, the basic is just an elimination diet of everything. You fuck meat. everything yeah. off and just eat meat. Yeah. And how long have you been on this? Since um, about my fifth week. Yeah. So, yeah, right up my alley, like when like those sort of things are like, like said, oh, you just need to eat meat and see what happens. I'm like, yeah, I've got to try that. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like don't, worry, don't even worry about it. But it was a, like an easy transition. I love my meat, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, and then so you're you're five weeks into it. Um, yep. just finished my fifth day. What's the benefits of uh, actually? Before we fucking start talking <laughs> yeah, about this exactly. shit, this is a fucking disclaimer. <laughs> need some disclaimers. Yeah, guys. yeah, we need some disclaimers. Like, we're just not. We're, do you have any background in nutrition no, or anything? No, we're just two just guys talking about our experience. Yep. Yeah, two guys talking about our experiences here. Um, you, you can try it if you want, but that's up to you. But just as a disclaimer, we don't know what the fuck we're talking about. We're just talking exactly. about experiences. Exactly. Fucking disclaimer. Listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so what 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 like what's the benefits that you felt? So yeah, so sort of like the cravings are gone. Um, like just the craving cravings for certain foods like carbs, like and all that because you get no carbs. Um, but in the first couple of days, like cravings are like skyrocket. I felt. Um, There's a part of your brain that sort of when you get away from carbs, what's turns to glycogen, which is essentially sugar. And once it, once the brain gets rid of that, it's like when um, so like a drug addict's trying to get off the, there's a certain part of the brain that does something similar. I think, right? yeah, something like that. Like, I'm not too sure. I'm not going to speak ice, on it. Ice the scientist some, now. <laughs> someone's going to quit. Disclaimer, not like, a scientist. That fuck is out there. So, <laughs> nah, but um, yeah, I think anything you restrict on yourself, you're always going to want. Like, I think it's just built into human psyche. You know what I mean? You take technology away, you're going to want it. Or you're going to take this away, you're going to want it. But um, yeah, it's with the carnivore diet, so hunger pretty much went away. Um, After still, how long? Still comes and goes. Like, um, say the first, by well, the fifth, fifth or sixth day. Yep. Um, and then yeah, you sort of just don't feel hungry. Um, and but it still comes and goes. Like now, like. I haven't eaten today. Like I follow the intermittent fasting sort of routine. So in the morning I'll just have a long black and then lunch, have some mints and then dinner steak or wash, rinse, repeat that. Like that suits my lifestyle. It's not for everyone, but um, like easy, easy to do. Um, so there's only like, there's no way to like fuck it up properly. Like, you know what I mean? Like you, everyone wants to like, when they first start, like they want to go beef, lamb, like what's all this stuff? What's all this? Just start real simple. Oh, actually, I better not tell everyone how to start, but that's how I started. Um, and then, yeah, energy levels are just crazy. Um, I've had like, I'm up in the morning and then I just have like, like I feel like I don't have dips during the day like I normally do. And then I'm pumping pretty much from early in the morning when I start coaching, like 5, 6 a.m. sometimes, all the way up to 9 p.m. at night. Yeah. Mm. So I'll, I'll, I'll vouch for everything he said. And I'm only five days in, and I know there's an element of placebo and yep. something new that's exciting. Yeah. I felt the same when I went vegan as well at the yeah, start, exactly. you know what I mean? So, um, But I didn't have that sustained energy that I have right now. Yeah. And what I mean by this is like anyone that sort of follow me or is know me, quite erratic, like I'll wake up in the morning and just go whoosh, like take off and then by the time I get to two and three, like boom, like need a nap, need like need sugar. Yeah. Like need chocolate, need a coffee. I could easily go through the day without a coffee right now. Yeah. Um but that sustained energy and it's it's not like you're upbeat all the time. It's just like you're level headed. It's like you've got mental clarity yeah, all the time. And one of the big 
key points that I'd notice, we'll go play basketball and I'll play basketball the last three days in a row, is as after about two or three o'clock, I'll be back in the office and I can get back into a workflow straight away. I'm not distracted. I'm not fucking around on Instagram, like looking at stupid shit. I don't know. I just feel, I just feel clear. I just feel calm and I'm sleeping a bit. And some, someone that's struggled with sleep over a long period of time, like I haven't stayed up past 1030 in the last couple, like last week, which yeah. has been pretty exciting for me. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, that's the energy levels, like the main like sort of factor that I like about it. And, um, so I'd done it with my missus as well. And yeah, she'd done it easier than me. I felt like I struggled for the first week hard, but she like two or three days she struggled and then like just the cravings and the hunger, like and just sort of the the mindset of like, oh, I can't eat like I'm not eating veggies. I gave her a little bit of green veggies just to start her off because it was just too much of a jump to go from her diet, which was quite high in carbs, past three, like she's Maltese, mm. and then um just the straight straight meat so we've done a bit of greens and some we put some yogurt and like blueberries in there as well and then but now she's none of that so she's just full bought into it yeah. she's just all meat now how's she feeling yeah she's great she's um lost five kilos yeah like she's swimming in her clothes like now it's like he's gonna have to go shopping for new clothes <laughs> like expensive that. yeah <laughs> it's only shit thing about the carnival yeah <laughs> hey want some clothes yeah, she's looking com. amazing her skin's way better and her hair she's noticed and um yeah but not without yeah so like yeah she done it good like i i sort of meal prepped her, all her food and she likes the simplicity of it like we just cook a big thing of mints and then that's our lunches for like nearly the first three or four days and then we do another another cook up during the week yeah um so like just Everyone sort of associates with weight loss. And I've had, I had two guys, because I said I was going on it on Sunday, Monday, and they've jumped on it straight away. And one guy messaged me today, and this is just going off. I don't want to put his details out there, but he goes, bro, I've lost five kgs already. <laughs> and people associate diet with weight loss. Yeah. But for me, I just want to fucking feel good. Because yeah. I've got a fucking bunch of shit going on. I've got people relying on me, but I, yeah. I just want to be on like all the time. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's, that's, that's the biggest benefit I've got over. I, I didn't weigh myself at the start, but. I think I will by the end of the month and see and measure it. I want to give it a whole month before I start like pumping yeah, it up yeah. and sort of pushing people onto it. Yeah, You're probably exactly. in a better position than I am to yeah, talk about. So I started with two other guys as well. Oh, through Real Movement, we started a whole community. So Because this Carnival like, month is January, isn't it? Yeah, so Real Movement lo- launched the, sort of their own version of it and then I got two other guys to jump on with me and they lost ten, they've lost they lost 10 kilos to date from... What, each or to combined? Each, each. yeah. So... One was at about 120s down to 110. Mm. One was at one, 108 and he's under 197 or something. Like moldy boys, big moldy boys. Um, and exactly the same what we just described, like less hunger, you know, very simple. Energy levels are fine. You know what I mean? They're just everyday guys that just, you know, not like, like former pro- professional athletes or anything like that. So, yeah. so um, you gave me – Another disclaimer, like this, he gave me a sort of basic model to follow. Get us in trouble, bro. You can follow. You can follow <laughs> it if you want. This is up to you. But this is the model I follow, and this is the one he gave me. And it's basically like intermittent fast during the day up until twelve. Um, have mints. Um, actually, just start with red meat at the start. Eh? That's that was yeah. the sort of big one. And yeah. people talk about the downsides of this carnivore diet. And Joe Rogan was big on this. He said he got the shits. And I haven't had it. And we were talking about it off air before where I've had one shit where I thought like, fuck, this is the start of it. <laughs> this is Barley Bally 2.0. Yeah. And like my shit just went like this. was boof, like dropped out. And like, that was it. Yeah. Like it wasn't like a normal type of shit. It just went, and I was like, oh, is this, this must be what it's like. And people will have shits and you got, you had it, eh? Yeah. Yeah. So with, yeah. So that's the, sort of the main thing. Your sort of shits get a bit muddled up with it just because your gut's trying to deal with all the new meat that's coming in. Like, probably two or three times more than you're used to. Mm. Um, but I've found, like I told you, just stick basic beef straight away. Like don't try and go lamb, pork, chicken and all that to start. I have just, a bit of bacon though. Just Yeah, bacon's, yeah, that's all right. Like long as it's not like so varied, you know what I mean? Because then you don't know when you're, like when something does go wrong, what it actually was because mm. you're just so spread out. So like I told, same with my missus, I told her just, just stick. But she was like, oh, but... I can eat all the other meats. I say just first week, oh, just listen. do basics. Yeah. Just do the basics, and then yeah, that worked for her. And then 
start I, adding something in yeah, there later. Yeah, then add in, add in one thing, you know what I mean? I feel that's the best sort of start that you can do with it. It's funny, like three days in, we were down in Coogee and uh, my girlfriend wanted to eat out somewhere down there and we went to that and only had like chicken snitties like yeah. as the meat. So I was like, oh, I'll just get two of those, like ate them straight. And like I didn't feel as good the next day. Yeah. And it's something I measure because I journal like every day of how I felt. But yeah, the red meat is the easy one for me. And, like, I'm cooking in butter. I'm having um, bone broth yeah. uh, morning and night. Like I'm just not hungry at night time and I'm just, Body yeah. just start shutting down the lights go off and later yeah it's the the funny thing about it is it's so against everything that's being pushed or everything that you should do which is right up my alley i'm always like yeah when everyone zigs i zag and do something different you know what i mean so like like veggies are, ha- are healthy um you need fiber like all that stuff, it goes against all those rules. And I was like, man, how much, how's my body going to adapt with no fiber in it? Like you need that to shit, don't you? Like that was, that was my understanding anyway. And I haven't had fiber for a month. And yeah, I'm pretty regular now with like toilet and all that. So. Yeah, that's good. All right, we're just going to get into a part now. We're going to ask a bunch of questions uh, that we've reached out to you guys and get Lukey onto this pretty, pretty soon. All right. So the first one we have... <clears throat> Uh, what are your thoughts on the current state of the fitness industry with certain influencers, Instagram models giving out advice? We're at a point now where PT is kind of an easy industry to get into, same as a clothing company, same as real estate, and everyone's pushing out content. What's your thought on it? Um, yeah, that's a, t- that's a tough one. My thoughts on that would be um, I think everyone's health, fitness is their um, own responsibility. So if you go out and like – try stuff and it doesn't work, then fuck, that's on you, like, tough shit, like, you know what I mean? If you spend $5,000 on a stack of supplements to lose weight and it doesn't work, then that's on you, like, you should own your life and your responsibility, so whatever anyone's doing out there, like, all these Instagram, like, sometimes I might not agree with them, but to blame them for your health or how your health is at the moment... Um, yeah, you got to be the one who's responsible for that. Do you I know? Feel. Do you know what I've found over the past? And someone that's tried a lot of diets and like, I've, like I've got some down to some of the pretty low body weights at time when I was playing football. Yeah. Um, all these different diets they actually all work, eh? Like, there's not yeah. one that's like, fuck, this is the way to live. Yeah, yeah. So like the things behind diets, like the main thing is consistency and discipline. Like, fuck, if you don't have that on carnival and you just go off and on, like it's not going to work. If you carnival, yeah, vegan, pescatarian, everything, paleo. Like, there's no secret sauce out there. Like, it all works. I could make the broccoli diet work and be heap shredded, or like, you know what I mean? Or the banana diet, like, because I'm disciplined. I know the discipline to do it. Like, that's the main part that people miss, you know mm. what I mean? All right, cool. Uh, who's your favourite uh, person to follow in the industry? Um, who's my favourite? Um, so, I probably mentioned Wim Hof. He's good. Um, I don't know who I'm following at the moment. Knees over toes. He's yes. Knees over toes. We'll give him a mention. He's probably yeah. He's probably changed my whole training in the last three months. So I was very strength and conditioning, trying to get everyone to squat and dead heavy. He's got some new things. So a bit of background behind him is uh, he's a basketball coach trainer. Had a lot of knee problems. Yeah, he had four knee recos, and then he fixed himself through exercise. And sort of, I've sort of taken on that whole system now. So, like, it's sort of not just for knees. It's not just for basketball players. It's like actually a whole athletic performance system. Everyone's got fucking knees, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone's got broken knees, broken ankles, shoulders, and hips. Yeah. So, cool. uh, aesthetics versus overall happiness and health. What's more important? Yeah, happiness because. That's going to eventually take over your, f- like, physique anyway, if you know what I mean. Like, long-term-wise, you can't lift heavy the whole for the whole of your life. You can't just keep up that high intensity. So, like, happiness for me. Do they work coincide? Mm, I think you have to adjust as you get older, I think. Yeah, I think um, – too sure on that one. Um yeah, but I'd pick happiness over. Aesthetics is important. Yeah. It's great to look yeah. at yourself in the mirror and yeah, go, fuck, so, I'm yeah, looking yeah. all right here. Yeah, no, nah, a bit of both, Lee. Happy with how you look, but not trying to think that that's going to make you happy. Because there's probably a lot of, there'd be a lot of influences out there that are ripped to shreds and still like yeah, in dark places, eh? Yeah. yeah so. uh, what are the best exercises for knee and back? Ooh, knee and back. So for the back, depending on 
This is very contextual. So back Jefferson curls. So it's a gymnastic movement. Um, you feel, I feel good after Jeff, Jefferson yeah, curls. Fucking great. <laughs> Not with the barbell though. I'm not thinking old barbell yeah. up here. And what's the other one? The knees. Um, probably they call it a Patrick step up. Um, knees over toes or a reverse sled or a split squat. Those three. Hey, uh, just uh, that you know that primal sitting position. Is that great for lower backs and Achilles as well? You know, when you're sort of squatting down. Like the Chinese sort yeah, of Yeah, the Chinese position. kind of squat, yeah. Because yep. you know, we go to Bali and the boys are on the side of the road and they sit there the whole day because that's, that's how we're meant to be able to sit eh, as yeah. humans. Yeah, but that's going to open up your hip flexors, yeah. So Ido Portel does 30 minutes a day, like a little challenge for mm. 30 days and you just accumulate 30 minutes and all that's going to do is just open up your hip flexors, if you know what I mean. Fucking hip flexors, <laughs> eh, Kalinas? It's all about the hip flexors. All righty. Uh, best advice for ex-footy players? Ex-footy players. Are you dealing with Nate stuff, Miles? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I was over in New York and I see him and he yeah. goes, oh, and I'll, he started bringing up you. And I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he was, um, yeah, horrible mobility, most footy players. And then, um, yeah, if I was an ex-footy player, um, yeah, work on mobility straight away. Would you ditch weights and go straight to mobility? Nah, just both. If you can, yeah. Or what's the balance percentage-wise? What would you have? Um, so I just do like 50-50. So I do – So if you're training for an hour, half an hour, you're things in mobility. Um, yeah, so what I do is I put – I like now you do a superset. Yep. So I superset my split squats with Jefferson curls. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I just work it like that and just – Kind of so makes you're sense. doing both, yeah. yeah so yeah. Jefferson curls is mobility mm. and then your split squats sort of your strength but also – some of the strength exercises through that knees over toes has mobility and and um and built pretty much. Mm. Yep. Uh, what's your morning routine? Morning routine: wake up, boy, no wash. That's what his morning routine is. <laughs> Go downstairs. Um, been training the family lately. Um, so I got a twelve year old son. Um, he's starting to get into training. Um, and my missus since we started this. Are you that dad? Diet. Are you? Are you that dad? Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah, I sort of Mark Orr Jr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, Get you us! Know, I said um, hundred dollars for his first chin up. You know, had to pay, had to pay up though. Fifty dollars <laughs> for every uh, ten push ups he gets. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of my root, routine. So this morning, then I just have a long black, and then I'm um, straight out the door to work. Shower, obviously. <laughs> Doubtful. <laughs> Fuck. I'm gonna get done for that. Uh, this one you guys just covered. What's your split ratio between weight and mobility? So. Um, the last one is, do you think knees Actually, are- sorry, sorry, sorry. Just to go off the back to that, before you w- do weight or anything, is there a mobility circuit that you would do or? Um, you- that I used to do, yeah. So at the moment, I'm at a level where, so. You feel good all the time. Yeah, so so I don't have to touch too much on mobility. So the good thing about mobility is it's not like fitness or strength where it just goes, you know what I mean? It stays. Like once you get to that position, say, um once you can touch your toes, you're going to always be able to touch your toes pretty much. Like there's going to be a little bit back and forth, obviously, but once you hit that mobility mobility level, like pancakes, lat splits, and all that, they're going to stay for the rest of your life. Actually, if you listen to this podcast, make sure you check out his fucking Instagram. His his mobility is fucking something different, and he he's not he's not like a lanky looking yoga looking. Bondi looking dude, <laughs> he's jacked up and he's fucking flexible and it's impressive. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, and ask one question. Anyone that's, say, normal like us, would you implement a morning or nighttime mobility routine that anyone can do at home? Yeah, so pretty much couch stretch, hip flexors, two minutes each side. It's just some, like, yeah, so just with that, there's sort of certain positions you tr- you should try and hit. So it's not just about the stretch and just spending time in that. You have to start you know, working towards something or you'll just always sort of, you'll get no progress and you'll just give up. Get bored, yeah. Yeah, like, you know what I mean? You're trying to um, turn the hips under and trying to get the shoulders back to the wall pretty much with that. You're trying to do some pike stretches. I love Jefferson curls, sitting in pancake, trying to get your head to the floor and all that stuff, yeah. How long does that take to Um, get to? 10 minutes a day, yeah, you'll be done. If you're just a normal sitting tree guy, how long till you can get your head on the floor? Ooh, very, very broad question. Yeah, but. very broad. Um, if you've done it every day for 10 minutes a day, fuck, <laughs> three to six months. Oh, really? Is that yeah, it? Yeah, I reckon. I thought you were going to top a couple <laughs> of years. On, but it depends on starting position too because some people just can't even turn over. But if you've already got a little bit of bend in you, yeah, you should be right. Shit. 
And see, me in, see me in three months. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think knees over toes style of training will be optimal for NRL players in the future? Yes. Just yeah. I'm 100% all in on that sort of style of training. I've sort of ditched all mine. I know it's going to, like, yeah, it's against what everything that's going on. But, yeah, that's my thing. All right, last question. What's what's Where do you want to be in five, ten years? What's the dream for you? So, yeah, just coaching footy players. Um, but you don't want to be a NRL trainer, though. No. So I sort of just want to do the private sector thing um, where footy players seek me out. So, you know what I mean? Instead of trying to be a strength and conditioning coach um, – and just work with the players more individually, like on their like weaknesses or what they need. Yeah. Sick. All right, Barry, where can people find you? Uh just Instagram, Troy N Finale Savage. Yep. yep. I will put all the links for your description. Barry, yep. thanks for coming on. I appreciate your time. Thanks, brother. Cheers. My guy.